Hey guys, what is up? Welcome to the third and last day of Virtual StripeCon 2020. With me on stage is Christopher Pitt, who was actually the first official speaker to be confirmed for this year's conference. So I think it's kind of cool that he'll be kicking it off for today, talking about solving problems with ReactJS hooks and context. Then we will have Luke Percy from Catalyst uh, demonstrating their software development lifecycle tool. And we will have Ingo Schommerbeck, the great Chilu, showing us how he trolls the community data lake. You guys know, when I was rehearsing this in my car earlier today, when I drove to the office, I kept saying data leak. So I'm kind of relieved it came out data lake. Anyway, not to forget, we will have another round of our beloved lightning talks. So you see, we still got three hours of neat conference action ahead of us, and I am pumped. Please stay with us. And now it's the time for Chris Pritt. Are you ready to do this? I am. Cool. So stage is yours. Cheers, buddy. Thanks, Julian. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, as Julian said, I'm Chris. And today, I have the pleasure of talking to you about React, context, and hooks. Uh, this talk was originally going to be a talk about all of the fun things we learned while using Silverstripe as a backend and Next.js as a front end. And there's a bit of that that has survived. Um, but the main thing that I want to uh, help you with today is context and hooks. So um, let's, let's jump into that. Um, I have a little bit more in my slides than what we're going to end up talking about for some motivation. So if you want to go through it at the end, um, I have some uh slides talking about why we decided to move off webflow what it is and why we decided to move also about the process that we took to get to silver stripe in the end it was a tie almost a tie between silver stripe and wordpress but um silver stripe went out on its merits more than wordpress lost on its uh drawbacks i guess um but there are there are reasons that motivated us to make that decision which you can also read up later i do want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> Excuse me. I do want to talk a little bit about our setup because I think it's helpful in understanding um, how different people deploy different uh, Silverstripe applications on various architectures. Um, we have uh, we've been using Silverstripe as a headless CMS in every sense of the word. We initially chose it because we wanted to move off of Webflow, and we're a seven person JavaScript mainly engineering team um, with four of us specializing in front end and three of us being sort of full stack developers. Um, but we, we, we moved off Webflow for various reasons and we wanted a system that would allow us to power our website, but also to power other things like newsletters and customer dashboards and, uh, and various mobile apps and campaigns, microsites. So that's how we started using Silverstripe. Um, we also, as I mentioned, have a Next.js front end for our main applications. Uh, we tend to use Next.js quite a lot, and I think it's I think it's fantastic. I'll talk a little bit more about it uh, coming up, but this is the front end for the main website and where a lot of the code examples that I show you come from. We also use Bitbucket pipelines. Uh, I'm more a fan personally of of GitHub, and I think they're doing a lot of interesting stuff um, lately, but uh, years ago, we picked Bitbucket, and we use their pipelines for all sorts of things. So when our apps are set up, we set them up with linting and automated tests and code style formatting. Uh, because we mostly do JavaScript, that code style formatting is with Prettier, but there's also a PHP plugin. So our CMS applications have this Prettier and PHP Prettier plugin installed. So all our Silverstripe code is formatted according to that as well, which is quite cool. And the pipelines also kick off deployment. Uh, that deployment happens to be on AWS and through AWS. And in my opinion, it's perhaps a little over-engineered. Um, we, we have this balance to do because it's FinTech and because we are acting as a startup but owned by uh, a big old uh, by a big old mature fintech company, uh, Sunlam Insurance, we have to check every box in terms of scalability and security. There are no, apparently, no reasonable shortcuts we can take. And so even 
potential vulnerabilities in build tools that never see the light of day outside of Indy uh, have to be checked and upgraded and bypassed. Um, things like that, you know. So our architecture is quite complex on AWS and our pipelines are quite complex, but we have a team dedicated to working those kinks out, uh, the platform team. And uh, yeah, so we host on AWS. I don't want to talk too much about Next.js. Um, as I said, the examples that I show you come from Next.js, but Andy did a fantastic job uh, of describing how to use Next.js uh, as a front end yesterday. If you missed his talk, hopefully there are recordings uh, that you'll that you'll be able to see, or you caught his talk. That would be <laughs> that's cool. Um, it was a very good talk. I, I I will say that the reason that we love it versus any other um, sort of React boilerplate app is that it is a it is a great starting point. Not only because it's quick to get started, but because it provides guardrails that I think are missing from base React. Uh, when when folks want to know, they're just starting out with UI development, and they want to know: Do I pick Vue? Do I pick React? Which one's better? They're both really great, but where I think Vue shines is that it provides good guarding rails. It suggests an application architecture and a way of interacting between components and state. And there are definitely things in the in the React ecosystem that help with the structure, but the main React thing provides so much flexibility, which tends to be flexibility that you can use to shoot yourself in the foot. And you learn to be a good React architect by making a lot of mistakes in architecting React stuff, whereas that doesn't happen as much with you, I, I find from, from my anecdotal experience. So um, next is actually the guardrails that I wish were promoted by the main React project. Um, it, it suggests an application structure. It suggests a way of doing server-side generation and rendering that I think are fantastic. You don't have to mess around with uh, Webpack or Babel directly. You can customize those things when you get to the point that you need to, like we got to in this app. But when you're starting out, it's three steps that you have to follow. You install some stuff, you add some scripts, and you make a page. And it works. You can get a next app running in five minutes, which is which is fantastic. In terms of making useful React apps, that's unheard of. So if you haven't tried it out, I would definitely recommend it. Uncle Cheese recommends it, so you know it's good. Do it. OK. Before I get too deep into uh, the React stuff, I also want to spend a few minutes talking about how we ended up using, or how we have ended up using Silverstripe, what modules we've uh, settled on. Because um, I, I love talks that do that. And so I'm just going to give you what I love, and hopefully you love it too. OK. I should mention, this is a distillation of stuff. We've gone through various different modules for each of these main things. And um, this is just where we've settled as, as things we really like. So it's not all we've tried. And you're welcome to suggest alternatives. And we're happy to have a look at those. But these are the things we like so far. Uh, we're using Heyday's Menu Manager. Because of the size of the application that we've migrated from Webflow into Silverstripe, uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of pages on this thing, and Sitetree does not do them justice in terms of organization. It's a fantastic model to maintain the content, but it is uh, unwieldy to generate menus based on Sitetree. So we've got a separate menu manager module, thanks to Heyday. Um, it looks a little bit like this. I think the branch that uh, Warren, who who I think should be in chat, um, I think the branch that Warren has going of this actually has drag and drop ordering added to this as well. But this is what uh, it looks like in the develop branch that that I have running locally. And um, so you define submenus, and each of these can have submenu items. So we've got our main header menu thing. We've got some footer menu things. They These are just identifiers. So we've also set up basic API endpoints that will request that data from uh, from the back end, from CMS, and be able to help us to render those menus on the front end. 
Um, we've got the usual culprits like there's there are submenus that get rendered from header navigation. There are submenus visible in footer navigation. Um, but there are also other there are also other um, places that these menus are used that you wouldn't naturally think. Like there are presentation sections in prominent pages of the site that list a list of product detail pages, and that is a menu by structure, but it's not a menu by convention. So uh, we're using this menu stuff all over the place. We just have to provide our API endpoint with the identifier for the menu and its items get loaded in and we can use them to render on our next front end. We're also using the Silverstripe blog module. We didn't initially want to use this because we didn't want to be too deeply wedded to the structure of the blog module. Um, and so we started with custom page types and then we then we considered what it would look like if we put all those blog pages into the site tree and then we went to lumberjack and then at that point we were just like okay well we've 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 looked at integrating lumberjack and doing our own categorization systems we may as well use the blog module and scale it back a little bit which is what we ended up doing i'll talk about that in bits and pieces but we use the blog module we use it in some weird ways um the holder pages don't generally look like blog holder pages um uh, we have three big blog-like things in the application. So we have a blog, which is probably the lightest in terms of blog content, but we also have uh, a help section, which is for help articles for where, where customers can go to figure out or to get help about the products they bought from us or how to use our systems or how to make claims or whatever. And then we have a learn section, which is another section full of articles about financial literacy and growth and success and over the site we have hundreds and hundreds of pages split into mostly into these main three sections but what we've had to do is we've had to subclass the blog section and the blog post from the blog module so that we can attach different categorization systems to those subclasses we have different categorization schemes between blog and learn and help and so we sometimes we have duplicate category names, but the pages mustn't live in both of those categories, um, or or at least the pages mustn't be visible in both of those sections. Or blog, for instance, we want tags, but we don't want tags for the other two sections. So we subclassed. We went to um, we went to effort of hiding the original blog section and blog post page types. Um, I've actually scaled back some styling here because we added custom styles so that when these things are disabled, they're not even visible on this page. So without my rolling back that style a little bit, you would only see these four enabled things that you could create at this point. Uh, yeah, so that's how we're using the blog module. We're using Silverstripe's markdown module. Um, because we're a JavaScript team, we do a lot of JavaScript stuff, and we uh, we have. Wow, I got distracted with a chat message. Um, we we have a component style guide in JavaScript in React JS and styled components, and it lives in a storybook. The URL I don't have on here, but I can probably dig that up if anyone's interested to see. So we decided on a visual style system that we wanted to, a visual design system that we wanted to implement, and we made a bunch of styled React components for those. We're using them in our main sales app, but um, we wanted to use those when we were still on Webflow, and we couldn't because it's a WYSIWYG editor, and we can't bring our own JavaScript into that. So what we've done is replaced all of the main content sections in our uh, Silverstripe application with a markdown field, which means the content editors can write in markdown, but it also means sufficiently trained content editors um, or, uh, or or can can do this or they can ask for help to do this to add React components into uh, those content areas. And then those can be style guide components. They can be components we've made just for the sake of the website. So like a contact form or a product feature section or a call to action to join a mailing list, those they can embed in the content editor and then they get rendered as React components on the front end, which is a really fun, a really fun way of organizing this. Let me mute because I'm getting alert notifications. Okay. So this is what that looks like. Um, the main markdown editor looks like this. Our fork, by the way, I should have mentioned this. We 
submitted some bug fixes to the module, but we also have some different ways of handling image uploads. So some of that stuff can be merged into the Markdown module. Some of it's just going to have to stay in a fork. The Markdown editor looks like this. Um, we've got Markdown content here, but then it also has some HTML looking stuff in, some React looking stuff in. And it's using a module in Next.js called MDX. We had some issues using that that were uh, that I've got later on in the slides that you can go and look at, um, or if we have spare time at the end, we can talk about that if you're interested. But this we can actually trace. So let's let's actually trace this. This is what it renders to. Um, pagination bar is this top sort of section here, oh, and it is these bits over here. Um, this product details container React component. Uh, is this section over here. And then everything below, starting with this SVG image and below, uh, is on this right-hand side here. So the output looks quite nice. But the the way to edit that in content is also pretty powerful. You do Markdown if that's all you know how to do. You can get help in. Or if you have some experience with it, you can put in React components that have been made specifically to enhance the site or, or other um, or, or other media through which this content is going to be loaded. Uh, then we made this, I, this this reusable content module. It's actually just a data object. But um, what we wanted to do was say we have a product and it is mentioned a dozen times over the site, and we want those bits of content to be dynamic. Um, the, the simplest way we could think of to do this would be to have a data object where we have some kind of identifier, and then MDX content inside uh, or associated with that identifier. So we can say if we have a funeral cover product, we can put the tagline for that or logos or embedded content against an identifier in this reusable content data object. And then we can have an API endpoint that we call with the identifier that gives us back this content. It's a very, very simple way of reusing this content. But it comes into play quite a lot in our context and our hooks code. So. Um, that's why I mention it. And then finally, we've got some API controller, uh, API controllers that give us API endpoints. We couldn't find a module that we understood how to use well enough to do what we wanted to do. Um, and actually, it's just really simple to set up API controllers in a Silver Stripe application without any modules. So we're not using GraphQL. We're not using the, uh, any REST modules. We are just using API controllers that return JSON data. Uh, and, and this is how it looks like when we request that stuff from the front end. So um, it, if we're developing locally, we probably don't have SSL um, for that host name. But if we're developing uh, or requesting data from a staging environment or a production environment, that will be um, with, with SSL, TLS, I should say. And uh, in that case, we, we load in the HTTPS agent um, this, this, because this is a node thing, this basically means this code should only be run on the server, um, which is fine because we want to do SSG and, and, and server rendering. So, uh, that's fine. <laughs> okay. So that's a very long, uh, preamble to the cool hooks and context stuff. I'm going to show you, get your questions queued. So. Reusable content shenanigans. It, this is a journey that we took to get to a bunch of code that uses hooks and that uses context. Um, and I've included all the refactoring steps because I think that's as interesting as the resulting code, right? Uh, it starts with this idea of building a component for the front end or for a, um, a campaign microsite, a component that maybe resembles this. If we have a list of products we want to sell, Let's make a product component that takes in a literal title and description and then renders that with some markup. If you're unfamiliar with React JS, it's essentially a um, a way to put HTML in line with JavaScript so that you can programmatically render out interfaces using JavaScript. So this is what a simple component could look like. You make a function that returns some markup um, and interpolates dynamic variables into that. Okay. Well, that's 
straightforward enough, I think, if you're familiar with React. But then the question arises, well, how do we make this dynamic? Instead of writing literal values for product title and description, what if we want to pull them from the database? Using, say, for instance, that reusable content module or data object that we set up, how do we make that data pull in here instead of the literal values? Well, you have, uh, with, with modern React, you have these things called hooks. Um, you can still pass in your title and description properties, but they don't need to be the literal values anymore. They can be the identifiers. Then you can use this use state hook. It's kind of like a box of state that your interface can use. So you're saying, give me this, I want to make this box of state. Here is the default value that goes into it. It's the title that we get from this prop. It gives you back a couple things. The first thing is that it gives you a snapshot of what that state is right now. So on this line, dynamic title is going to equal title because nothing has been changed about that. This is just a snapshot of the current state. But it also gives you back a setter that you can use to update the state. So we define these two state, these two boxes of state um, where dynamic title is equal to title and dynamic description is equal to description, and we get back these two setters. And then we can use this thing called use effect. It's another hook, and it runs. Uh, it, ca it can run in a number of different ways. The way that I've set it up here, it will run once when this component gets loaded. So when product enters the document, it will run the stuff. But then for everything that changes inside this array of dependencies, it will also run again. So it'll run once when the page loads, but then if the title property changes, it'll run it again. And uh, if the title changes again, it'll run the effect again. Um, so inside this effect, we can call to an API endpoint. I'm not going to go into the implementation of this. It is just a proxy to the CMS to fetch reusable content blocks by identifier. So we can call this endpoint and say, OK, I want to fetch whatever value I've given in as the title prop. I want to fetch the reusable content for that identifier. Get back a response, get the JSON, dereference the JSON so that we get the content, the meaty bits of that reusable content data object. And then call the setter with that, set dynamic title with the new content that comes from the backend. Calling this updates the dynamic title, which re-renders the component. OK, we can do something similar for description. When description changes or on mount, we can get the reusable content for whatever's been passed in as the description property value, and then call the setter with it, which means this dynamic description updates, which means this component rendering updates. That's how we make this dynamic. There's a bit of a pattern here that you can see. We use set states and use effect for each one of these props we want to look up. But there's also a problem developing, and it is that this is not very scalable. What if we have a component that has five props that we want to look up, or a dozen props that we want to look up? We're going to have a lot of boilerplate code that all does something very similar. Well, we can refactor this a little bit to have a new component whose job it is just to do this lookup. We can give it the name of the reusable content or the identifier of the reusable content that we want to look up. And it can have that state box that we saw previously. It can have that effect that we saw previously. And it can look up that data that we saw previously. So this component is an abstraction around that use state, use effect combo that we had in our product component. OK, but then what if we want to turn it off and on again? This is a, this is a, this is a question that came from Warren. And I, I hope Warren joins chat at some point but uh, so that you can ask him why he's asking me all these questions. But what if we want to turn it off and on again? Um, so it's feasible that we might want to use some products that have literal values and some products that have database-based values. What if the content? author is trying to reference a product that some other company has produced, we might not necessarily want to put that in our CMS. Or what if they haven't made a reusable component for it yet, and they don't know if they're going to. They just want to test the component for now. Well, we could use context for this kind of problem. Um, React has this create context function. It's, a, it's just a different kind of state box, similar to, to use state. But you can call it with a default value. I don't have a default value that I want to give it for now, so undefined is fine. And you can create 
context providers that have different default values. So let's make a context provider that says, by default, don't fetch data from the database. And the default value for that is it's not reusable. Is reusable is false. We can make another provider that says, by default, fetch the data from the database. And that's default value is, is reusable is true. So once we've imported these into our, say, our homepage, we can start to wrap certain nested components with these contexts. By default, don't fetch, which means this product is going to just use its literal values. But then further down or elsewhere in our document or elsewhere in our site, we might say, okay, we do want to fetch stuff that's ne that's nested inside this from the database. And so title and description become not literal values that are used, but lookups for reusable content. We have to modify our product component to deal with that though, right? Um, so instead of use state and uh, use effect inside here, we start to use a different hook called use context. We import the base reusable context we set up. That is this over here, the one that we're decorating the providers of. So we import that. And then instead of use state and use effect, we use context with that context that I just showed you. And what we get out is the values that are wrapped up in that context. So for both of the two context providers we defined, is reusable was true in one and false in the other, we can use the context and it will figure out where the most, uh, the, the nearest provider is and what the values are inside that. So is reusable will be true or false depending on how we've nested uh, the this con component inside the providers. And then if reusable is true, we can use our reusable component that does the lookup or just a literal value. This is less onerous than doing use state and use effect like we had initially, but it is still a little bit, a little bit boilerplate heavy. Um, but I think that's the cost of being able to switch this on and off, right? It's not where we stopped with this because then no sooner had this been uh, entered into the application when Warren came back and said, but what if we want to turn it off and on on the same component? And he broke my mind with that. Um, but it makes total sense. There are instances where you would want to have some values that don't change, like a product name doesn't change very often, but a product tagline might change very often. In, in, in social situations like, hey, there's a pandemic, so now our insurance, or our, our funeral cover should say something like, hey, don't worry about COVID, just get our funeral cover, you'll be fine, or whatever. Those taglines might change very regularly, but the titles shouldn't or don't, whatever. I, I'm trying to explain a situation or describe a situation in which you might want certain props that are usually going to be literal and some props that are usually going to be database-based and they are database-based and they can exist in the same component. So there, context stops working for us, right? Because you wrap the whole component, you don't wrap certain props in context. Okay. So then we step back context a little bit and instead we define a helper function. This helper function actually introduces another little uh, optimization, which I think is pretty good API design for React components. And it is that if the prop value is a function, we execute the function. And this gives us a way of having lazy evaluated props because now we can derive what that reusable components identifier is in a function. Um, before we start looking it up. But anyway, that's just a that's just a helpful side effect that doesn't actually relate to anything we've seen previously. So the main the main interesting thing here is now with our value of helper, we can give it a prop. And that prop, if it starts with a prefix of reusable, then the value we return is an instance of reusable, with obviously with that prefix removed. Otherwise, we just return the value as literal. And that means instead of using use state and use effect and use context, our product component becomes far more simplified. Um, it's still using those things behind the scenes, but we don't have to do that in every component. We can import the value of helper, and then we can say for every prop that might be based on reusable content, we wrap it in that helper. If it has the reusable prefix, it'll 
the, the, what gets printed here will be an instance of reusable components. Or if it doesn't have that prefix, it will just be the literal value, but it could be lazy evaluated as well. That's a really cool pattern, right? That's a really cool pattern. It's, it's quite a nice progression of refactoring that's gone on here. There's one more problem uh, that we wanted to solve with this, and you've probably picked it up already. And it is that every instance of these reusable components is responsible for making a new request to get a little bit of data, one reusable component data objects worth of data. And that's a lot of requests. It could be. Um, we have, for instance, if we have a dozen page, a dozen products on a landing page that is uh, with maybe like four props each that need to be potentially dynamic data, that's a lot of data, a lot of requests that happen. So how do we batch these things together so that they're not doing all these requests, right? Whether those requests happen in the client or whether they happen when the page is being rendered, it's still unnecessary traffic. We could batch these things together. And this is where things get really fun. So there's this interesting side effect where every popular bundler in JavaScript land rewrites imports and exports to some form of module exports or require. And then they share the imported content. So to phrase that another way, if you make a script called product and you import product in three places, all three of those places have exactly the same instance of that script. And if you define a top level variable, that variable is shared everywhere you import the same script. That's cool because we can make a new component called batched reusable. And instead of using effect, we still use set state because this component still needs its own little bit of state. But instead of using use effect and doing a fetch inside the component, we can push an, a reference to the kind of content we wanna look up, the identifier, and the setter function that will be used to render the final data for this component once it's fetched. We can push these to the, these, these t. We can push these two things into the queue, and then we can define a function that fetches all of the names of reusable content from that queue and joins them together and requests from the API a comma delimited list of reusable content identifiers. When that stuff gets returned, we can go through this queue and we can say, if you got content for that name, then call it setter. So by default, this batch reusable is not gonna render anything. It's gonna return null, remember? Because this is a snapshot of the content and until that gets called, it's just gonna be null. But when this fetch function executes and there are like 50 batch reusable instances, they're all going to get their setters called when this request is done. And so they are all going to get set content called and they're all gonna update. So this is how we can smush together the requests for all the different instances of reusable content into one request and one update cycle. And we can wrap this fetch reusable content function into a component that uses an effect. I've been quite light-handed um, light in talking about what you can return from use effect, but um, there's this pattern where, like sometimes if you wanna add an event listener to something in the browser, then you would add an event listener. And in previous uh, in previous versions of React, if you used a class, you could have like an, um, uh, a will unmount sort of life cycle event that you call to remove that event listener to clean up after yourself. Well, if use effect has a similar sort of mechanism where if you return a function from within use effect, then that function will get run whenever, in this case, fetcher, is unmounted. So you could add event listeners inside a use effect and then inside the callback you return, you remove those event listeners. Um, if we wanted to, for instance, cancel the fetch request that's happening here, I'm not gonna I, I'm not gonna show you code of that because I think it actually gets a little bit complex and, and distracts you, but you can do a search for abort controller. When you make a new abort controller, you get a signal property on it, you give that to fetch, and then if you want to cancel the fetch, you can 
go to that instance of abort controller and call the abort function. And via the signal, it will tell the fetch to cancel. Um, so you can cancel fetch requests. You could potentially do that inside of uh, this callback that use effect returns to cancel this effect in case the fetcher gets unmounted for some reason. Um, but I'm not going to show that implementation code because distraction. OK, you import the fetcher, and you make sure that it is run after any potential batch reusable instances happen. So when the fetcher mounts, it calls use effect. That causes fetch reusable content. And that goes through the queue and fetches all the content for all the different queued batch reusable instances, calls all their setters when it has that data, and all of them update at once. It's beautiful. I love this pattern. I love this pattern. If you are uneasy about storing that stuff in a top-level variable, um, I, I understand that. And you can use some kind of in-memory store or a file store or something to put that queue somewhere else that's not just in a variable. But go with the variable because it works very consistently and it's very simple to understand. And you know, OK. The other example I want to talk about is Redux, <laughs> Redux Lite. Um, hands up if you've used Redux. And then keep your hands up if you have enjoyed the process of using Redux and no one has their hands up anymore. Redux is, uh, is a wonderful pattern, but it is shockingly difficult uh, to, to get uh, initially. Um, there are a few big parts to this. And um, it's actually possible using hooks and context to level out this learning curve a little bit because it removes the need to learn about connection and higher order components at the same time as you're learning about how Redux works. Um, also, because you're not potentially installing the Redux library to do all of the stuff I'm about to show you, you also reduce uh, the number of dependencies that you have to install and lower installation time and all those, all those goodies. Uh, so I'll give you a crash course in Redux and and specifically in how Redux works with hooks and context. And the implementation is going to be different if you use the actual Redux library. It's going to be more and potentially more confusing. But the, the main parts of Redux are expressed using hooks and context here. So um, in Redux, you set up an initial state. Uh, it might look like something. It might look like this if you're setting up, say, a blog holder page. Um, where you don't have a list of posts until someone lands on the page and then you fetch them. Uh, you may not be in a loading state initially, and you're not you, you're not viewing any blog posts currently. But all of these things we want to be able to manipulate based on how the user interacts with the page. So you define your initial state in Redux. You also define a thing called a reducer. And a reducer, all, all a reducer is, is a function that takes in some initial state and and an action of something that's happened. And it returns the resulting state. Um, so take the state from where you are in your application. Hey, something happened. OK, here's some new state. That's all a reducer is. So it reacts to events that it cares about. This first property is a snapshot of the current state. And the second, this first argument, I guess, the second argument is um, the action that has just happened. So I've just dereferenced it so that I have the type of action and the payload, if there is any, that comes with the action. So I care about these four types of things happening in this little bit of state. So um, if someone lands, oh, there's a cat here. If someone lands on the blog holder page, uh, the blog holder is going to have some kind of effect and it's going to say, okay, now I want to load all the posts. So it will send this load action to my reducer. And my reducer will say, oh, we're loading. OK, well, modify some states so that I can represent in other parts of my application that I'm busy loading the posts. And then that blog holder page gets done with its fetch request. And now it has some blog posts. And so it says, OK, hey, state, now I'm sending this action to you. I have loaded. And here are the posts. So that's the type we care about. And the posts come in through this payload variable. So we can update this initial state that we had with some posts, and we can say that it's not loading anymore. So if we were showing some kind of loading spinner or loading text, we can roll that back and stop showing that. Uh, we care if we're viewing a blog post, and we care if we're going back from viewing a blog post to the list of blog posts again. Um, we can use this use reducer hook inside of our blog holder component 
So we give it the reducer function we declared just, just from the previous slide and the initial state we declared in the previous slide. And then we can do that use effect stuff that I was speaking about. When someone lands on the blog holder, dispatch this load action. Um, so this is just an object, it's what the action is. You can see there's the type property there. Um, this use reducer, I should probably say, is very similar to use state in that it's also, it, it, it what it returns is very similar to what use state returns. This is a snapshot of the state and it will update as the state updates. And this is similar to that set state thing where when you call dispatch with an action, it will go through the reducer. And so you'll probably get back a different state if you care about that action. So we tell state, we, we tell the reducer, hey, we're gonna load now. We do our fetch to get all the posts from the back end. And when we've got them, we dispatch again to say, okay, now we finished loading. Here is a payload with all the different posts that we care about. And because I've dereferenced this state snapshot, I've got access to posts and whether it's loading or not, and whether we're viewing something or not. So if we're loading, we, sp we display some text. If we're viewing something, we can show the post component for that. And otherwise, we can just default to showing a component that has all the posts in it. Maybe the post view uh, comp component that we've got has a little X in, in, in the top right corner. And how do, we, how do we make sure that when someone clicks on that, it tells the reducer, hey, we're going back to the posts list page. Well, you can pass in a callback that dispatches that action that we care about. And then this post component, when that X button is clicked on, can call the prop that it got for on back. Similarly, when we've got a list of posts and we select one, we can dispatch an action that says, okay, this actions type is view because we're viewing a post and this is the post that we're viewing. If you get these three things, setting up initial state, setting up your reducer and using it in this way, this way that you see on the slides, you understand Redux. You don't need to learn all the other things that Redux provides. You may get to a situation where you uh, start to get more and more and more state that you wanna store. And this question can arise, how can you share state? So how can you, um, how, sorry, how can you share reducers and initial? So you don't necessarily wanna define those where you're defining your main component. You wanna like, put them in, a, in one file and import that everywhere else. How do you share them? How do you mix and match so that you define the reducers for like one domain object like users and a separate domain object like products? And how do you combine those things together and use all the state together? You can follow a pattern like this. So again, we, we use our trusty friend context. Um, we can define initial state and reducers for each of our domain objects that we care about and we can combine them. So we can export an initial that is made up of all of our other initials that we've defined. And we can export a reducer that is made up of all our other reducers that we've defined. We use context because we don't want to do this combining every time we want to use the reducers in the initial. So we import these things that we care about, our context that we've created, which is thus far empty our initial state that combines all of our other initial states and our initial reducer that combines all of our other reducers. And then we can use reducer inside a new app provider. Okay, so we, we load in our combined reducer, we load in our combined initial state, and then we store these references for the snapshot of the current state and the dispatch function in the, our app context provider, which was empty until now. And when we wrap the rest of our app around this, then everything inside of that provider can now use context to get the state and to get the dispatch. So it would look something like this. We can import our context. We can, if we have any action creators that create those objects that say a type and a payload, we can import those as well. And then instead of use reducer, we can use context for that context that now has a snapshot of all of the combined states and all of the combined reducers. And so we get back our states, we can do use effect like we were doing before, and we can dispatch types of actions um, like we were doing before. And we can also look into what our states are. So are we loading? Show a loading message. Do we have products to show? Render each of them out. That's basically it. So that's a good, uh, a good sort of introduction into Redux without using the Redux libraries, but using hooks and context and, and kind of simplifying the process by which we write these things and use them. And, uh, Hopefully, if you've been avoiding Redux because of the complexity that you've that you've seen, this 
is a, like a much less complex way of, of trying this out um, and shows a very useful way to use context and hooks together. I think that's uh, all I really have time for. I, there are, before before we go to questions, there are um, additional bits to this. So there were a couple of silver stripe related things that we came across that might be um, might be interesting to know how to do. And there's also some problems we had with MDX and uh, and CSP that you might want to uh, be able to work around using the fantastic mechanics in Next.js. So you can have a look at those. I'll put a link to these slides in um, in Hopin so that you can get to this. OK, so questions. Chris, thanks a lot. Very cool opening for today. Cool. I hope it's useful. I think so. Guys, do you have some questions for Chris? And please have a look at my new poll about Redux. Chris, and thanks for being on time. Perfectly to the minute. <laughs> cool. No questions? Okay. Chris, uh, will you stick around a little bit if somebody wants to reach yes. out in the network session or the chat? Yeah. Okay. That'll be cool. Ah, there, there's a question from Ingo. How many pages do you have and how long does your next JS build take? Assuming you're uh, using get static routes for some of them. Yes. So we, um, we designed it to use uh, get static paths and get static props. Um, from the beginning, we we actually encountered some issues with using that in our pipelines um, because initially we had the secrets for our uh, APIs and things like chat widgets and all those kinds of things. We originally had those secrets inside Bitbucket and the platform team have been working to move those secrets into AWS so that they're not in Bitbucket. And the problem with building with running next build is that it wants to get those things to build the pages initially. So one of the issues that we've had to deal with is actually rolling back some of those get static pods, get static props things so that they don't happen in the pipeline so that they happen um, when the pages are requested. And there's like a, there's a caching mechanism that we've got there um, because we're no longer doing SSG throughout, but that's, that's how we designed it. And the, the medium term goal is to move the pipeline stuff that deals with secrets into AWS so that we can go back to that code. So it's feature flagged at the moment, but the, the medium term plan is to use just that and not to use get server props. Um, we've had to fall back to get server props for certain sections in the site, but the build is the build takes um, about 30 seconds in total to do the next build stuff. The, the AWS provisioning and deployment stuff takes a lot longer actually than our build. And we have hundreds of pages in this application. So it is um, it is quite quick to do, um, quite quick to build. All right. Thanks a lot.